Now, for our Scripture reading this morning, we turn back to the 19th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke and to verses 28 through 48, Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, and beginning to read at verse 28. You'll find this passage in the Pew Bible on page 878, and for our children who have their children's Bible, it is on page 1294, 1294. Let us hear God's Word. When Jesus had said these things, He had uh, just finished in Luke's account this parable of the Lord who received a kingdom in verse 12 and who calls His servants to give account of their service. When He had said these things, Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when He drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, He sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, Already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. These words were indeed fulfilled in AD 70 in the Roman destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple, and the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. Our motivation a few weeks ago when in our series of studies in Luke's gospel here we simply skipped over this passage was, of course, to return to it as an appropriate passage for Palm Sunday. That was my only motive in skipping the passage. And yet, as I returned to it in the past day or two, there is an incidental note in it that struck me as being particularly poignant and unusually relevant for us. And that is that as Luke marks for us the beginning of the last week of the life of our Lord Jesus, you'll notice he positions the beginning of his narrative as they draw near to Bethphage and to Bethany. 
And if we are readers of the gospel and know something about the life and ministry of Jesus, we know that Bethany was one of his favorite places. It had a very special significance for him because of some of the people who lived there, and especially Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Indeed, in a very striking statement, not quite unique, but still a very striking statement, the Gospels tell us particularly, pointedly, that Jesus loved this particular family. And one of the reasons He loved them, and we see this coming to expression during the last week of His life, when at least some of the days of this last week, at the end of the day, He seems to have left Jerusalem and gone the couple of miles down to the village of Bethany to stay there overnight. One of the reasons He loved this village and its people was because, not to put too sharp a point on it, they had provided for Him a missionary house. Jesus is God's missionary. Most people know John 3.16 which tells us that God sent His Son as a missionary. And while we so often as evangelical or conservative Christians have found ourselves kind of trying to defend and demonstrate the deity of the Lord Jesus, it's all too possible for us to lose sight of the deep reality of His humanity and not to notice the little windows that the gospel writers give to us of how much human company meant to Jesus, how much a home where He knew He was loved and there were people He loved meant to Him, how much those hours of refreshment must have sustained Him during this very dark week of His life as He goes to the cross of Calvary. Need I say more than that our Lord Jesus has taught us, inasmuch as you have done it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you have done it to me. Wouldn't you want your home to be a missionary home for the Lord Jesus? And don't you think in the providence of God, as I say, this was no part of the reason for reserving this passage until now, but surprise, surprise, these, these little time bombs that are providentially planted into the Scriptures come alive with an explosion today, as in these days we think together about how we respond to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us by seeking to do something for those who, like Him, are missionaries. That's not the central issue, but it may not be unrelated to the central issue, because the central issue here, and you see it unfold in the way in which this passage seems to crack open and divide between the people who see and hear Jesus and see and hear the crowd welcoming Him, that the whole issue that spread before us in this passage is the issue of whether Jesus is to be king and what kind of king Jesus is to be and what that implies for those who through His Word have come into contact with Him. There are obviously three scenes here that correspond to the paragraphs in our Bible. First of all, the scene familiar to us in which the king rides towards the capital city, and the crowds break into praise. Of course, they were pilgrim crowds, and one of the things apparently they loved to do in any case was to sing the Psalms together as they made their way to Jerusalem. And so, some of the phrases and language that appears here comes directly out of the Psalms they are singing 
the Psalms that had spoken about the coming of the great King and the realization that had dawned on Jesus' disciples here, for all they little understood what they were really saying, that Jesus was the King, and that actually He was very deliberately showing that He was the King. This, of course, is the function of Him sending His disciples into the village to get this animal that no one has sat on. And when the owners of the animal protest, eh, the one who is the Lord of all things needs the animal. And so, they acquiesce to His desire, and the disciples lead Jesus in this way in triumph as He makes His way towards Jerusalem. And uh, John's gospel tells us that although they didn't fully understand what was happening here, it dawned on them later on as they began to put together the prophecies of the Old Testament Scriptures, and especially of Zechariah, with the sight that they had seen that Palm Sunday day, that what Jesus was saying by His actions was that He was the long-promised King that Zechariah had promised in Zechariah chapter 9, who would ride in triumph in meekness and lowliness on an ass. And it was this great picture that obviously captivated Luke's mind, and clearly he wanted to capture the spirit and the heart of Theophilus for whom he was writing his gospel. Do you see, Theophilus, the people acclaiming Jesus as King for all the mighty works that they had seen Him do, we are told in verse 37. Now, Theophilus, you have seen through the eyes that have read the pages of my gospel the mighty works that the Lord Jesus has done. Are you with those who praise Him and magnify Him as their King? Or you will notice the implication is, are you hiding there in the crowd with the Pharisees who complain that people are praising Jesus? It sometimes struck me as wholly understandable, and yet perhaps not wholly faithful to this story, that when churches, as some churches do, reenact this Palm Sunday event with choirs or children coming into the church and waving palm branches and crying out, Hosanna, there is a part of this story that no church I've ever known enacts. And that's the part where the Pharisees in the crowd grumble and call upon Jesus to stop people praising Him. And in my more melancholic moments, I've thought, Maybe we don't need to reenact that part of the Palm Sunday story because we so readily, alas, reenact it in our lives. How do you respond to somebody who is wildly enthusiastic about praising Jesus? How do you respond to that in a church service? How do you respond to that when someone that you know in the circles in which you move proves to be a, a little too enthusiastic for Jesus. Now, sometimes we Christians are very foolish, but if there is something within me that says, I don't like to hear Jesus praised this way, I find it embarrassing I find it annoying. I find it irritating. And the very same issue that was before people on that first Palm Sunday is surely also with us. And the tragic thing is that as Jesus rides into Jerusalem as King, He does so in meekness and humility and lowliness. My dear friends, that is the wonderful thing about our Lord Jesus. He combines in Himself kingly power and authority. 
It's not every man that can ride an animal that's not been broken in, even from the human point of view. Kingly power and gentleness and grace. And when you're a sinner and recognize that you are a sinner in need, that's exactly the kind of Savior you need. You need one whose heart is gentle and meek so that you can pour your needs and your waywardness and your sins and your shame. You can pour it into His heart because you know He cares and is gentle, and yet by the same token is royal and powerful and has authority to pardon your sins, and to transform your life. What a glorious picture this is of the king riding towards the city of Jerusalem. But the second frame of the picture is rather different, isn't it? You see how the atmosphere suddenly changes in verse 41 when Jesus draws near. Now the king who rides towards the city pauses and is the king who weeps at the city's tragedy. Oh, Jerusalem, verse 42, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. And you notice what uh, Luke tells us about the Lord Jesus here. He wept. That's not sentimental tears. Um, it might be better to say he sobbed. It's the picture, if you had seen him, you would have noticed his heaving chest as his inner being seemed to be broken up with emotion as he caught sight of the city of Jerusalem, which he had so often visited, where he had brought the gospel of peace and the message of his grace. And the reason Jesus is sobbing here, as he says, is that Jerusalem did not know the things that belonged to its peace. Actually, this whole scene is reminiscent of something that took place in David's life as he moves in a different direction during the treachery of his son Absalom. And you remember in approximately the same spot, David brokenhearted at the treason, not only of his own people, but of his own family, wept, 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 wept deeply. And here is Jesus looking on Jerusalem. You remember how at the beginning of the gospel, the message of the gospel of Luke was encapsulated in the message of the angels to the shepherds, peace on earth. And what His disciples had been singing marvelously was like an antiphonal response to the message of the angels. They had sung of peace in heaven. Or we might say they had grasped something of a sense that through the Lord Jesus who had come from heaven, there might be peace for them with heaven. And Jesus is saying the great tragedy of the people of Jerusalem is that it's all before them. What He calls in this passage the time of their visitation, it's all before them, but they simply can't see it. They're blind to it. They've become like the people Paul describes in Romans 1 and Ephesians 4, that spiritual realities are staring them in the face. But they say, I can't can't see what people are excited about. I don't know why people respond this way to Jesus. I can't understand why they're so enthusiastic about Jesus. I don't see what's… I just can't get what's wrong with them. But the blindness is in our own eyes and in our own hearts. And Jesus recognizes that the ultimate entail 
of that spiritual blindness is that having had the opportunity of the day of God's visitation in Jesus Christ and never having seen Him as He is or trusted Him as their Savior and Lord, there was a sense in which God had no further dealings with them in that generation. And so, Jesus looks forward with an awful sense of foreboding to the fact that those, those who have the day of the visitation of salvation, but stubbornly resist it, and then are blind to it, there is nothing left for them but a foreboding darkness. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, just as later on David would say with heaving heart about his son who had been so treacherous to him when his son was killed, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. And here is Jesus who has come to his own people, who have had his own word pointing all of them, to His saving grace. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, isn't He? O oh, Columbia, Columbia. O oh, South Carolina, South Carolina. And perhaps it's even individualized. Oh, 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 the deep longing of a sobbing Savior. And they still would not come. And that brings us to the third little cameo here. The king rides into the city. The king weeps because of its tragedy. And as he enters the temple, he expresses his passion for its purity. It's really interesting, Luke's gospel, how at the, at the end of the beginning of the narrative of Jesus' birth, we've got this message of peace on earth. And now at the beginning of the end, we've got this message about peace in heaven. And how at the beginning of the narrative of Lord Jesus, really right at the end of the beginning of the narrative of the Lord Jesus, we've got Jesus in the temple asking questions. And now, as we come to the beginning of the end of the narrative, we've got Jesus again in the temple, and this time He's asking a very different series of questions. And He's turning the merchants out of the temple because they've turned it into a den of robbers when God had intended it to be a house of prayer. Do you see what He's doing? It's awesome, really. He is beginning the desecration of this temple. The next step that will be taken in that desecration in a temple that has refused to recognize the Lord Jesus is that one of its most sacred objects, that great heavy temple curtain, will be torn in two from the top to the bottom when Jesus dies on the cross and makes a way of access into the presence of God in Himself, and the temple is further deconsecrated until finally is those who have heard over and over again of the prophecies that point to the coming Savior and the pictures of sacrifice that point to His sacrifice for sin on the cross, but have rejected the meaning of them all. Eventually, the temple itself will be destroyed and has not been rebuilt. What's it all saying? It's saying that Jesus Christ 
is a gracious Savior and a masterful King. But when we resist the day of His visitation, there is nothing left for us but ultimate disaster. His words are so deep and so penetrating. May they be deep and penetrating for us too. This may very well be for you this very day, the day of His visitation. Maybe the very first day in a church service you've ever, you've ever been conscious of anything special, may have been in a hymn or words in a prayer or in the reading or in the message. You've, you've lost sight of the, the accents of the people who have been taking part in the service, and you've begun to hear another accent altogether that's spoken right into your heart, right into your conscience, and it's the day of visitation. And Jesus is really saying here to us, my days of visitation do not go on forever. Just as Paul will later say, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of visitation. And so we want to say to him, because we are worse than patients in a sick bed, we are sinners in need of salvation. We want to say to him when he comes, as it were, riding in this kingly majesty and wonderful grace and saving mercy, as he rides into our lives, we want to say to him, Lord Jesus, you've come to visit me. I didn't know you cared for me so much as to visit me, as to want to speak to me, as to want to comfort me in my sinfulness and pardon me and transform me. And when He does so, we want to stand up and cheer and say, Hosanna to the King of David. Save me now. Save me now. And He rides into our lives in His saving majesty. And the day of visitation is the first day of blessing that lasts throughout all eternity. Oh, surely, 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 you want to say to Him, Hosanna, King Jesus, save me now. Rule me now. Transform me now. What a great Savior. Let us, in His mercy, live for His glory. Heavenly Father, thank You, thank You, thank You for the gift of Your wonderful Son to become our Savior and our Lord. We pray as both His majesty and His grace are set before us in the pages of the gospel story, that we may be inwardly persuaded that He is the very same Savior and Lord today, and can do all things well for us, can bring us pardon, can visit us with His grace, can strengthen us in His service, and bring us home to glory. And so we cry out to You, Lord Jesus, Hosanna to the King. Save us and rule us. And we pray this in Your name. Amen.